So the best way to uh, describe F jams puzzles is to think of puzzles as cheese. You can have a whole lot of cheese, but every now and then you just need goat cheese. And goat cheese is, is really exquisite. You don't want it every every day, but when you do have it, it's just amazing. So yeah, F Jam is the goat. F Jam is relentlessly authentic, maintaining a very high standard for himself without ever compromising big ideas. He sets puzzles no one else would. For me, one of the things that stands out about F Jam as a setter is his takes on some of the most novel rule sets possible which either can be impressively accessible or would just require a very high extreme level of knowledge. But even so, in that case, there's always something nice and fair to grasp for and acknowledge, which by their own is also very impressive. Yeah, so what I like about FGM's puzzles is that he's willing to use very unique ideas uh, that might even make some solvers uncomfortable. He's also utilizing them throughout the whole solve consistently, not just for the break-in, for instance. And maybe as a side note, uh, his execution is always flawless and elegant. Solving an SGM puzzle is like having a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, but you keep wanting more. Oh, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to the interview of the GOAT, <laughs> FGM. How are you doing today, FGM? I'm doing good, thank you. Well, we're happy to have you here, uh, and I know that Zeta is streaming right now, so if you guys have one uh, stream on one <laughs> screen and the other stream on the other, that's totally fine. Um, I know Zeta has a lot of supporters in my chat, so, and if you're catching this after the fact, uh, welcome, welcome to the future. Um, <laughs> and uh, thank you, thank you to everyone on the screen here, on the edges of the screen here. These are my Patreon or Ko-Fi supporters, so thank all of those people for this interview and other interviews, because they have voted for these people, and you can vote yourself if you want. Uh, these are the sort of votes so far, and we have some people who have not reached 10 votes yet, which is the threshold to get in. And uh, yeah, check that out. The link's in the description. All right. Let's go back here, and we will get into some warm-up questions with the guest today, FGM. All right. So... Uh, Do you have an unusual skill or talent, FGM? Uh, an unusual skill or talent? Um, it's a I'm, I'm a reasonably adept salsa dancer. Oh, so I quite interesting. Enjoy that. Yeah. That, that yeah. is quite an, an unusual skill or talent, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, certainly not something that everyone, everyone probably does around this community. Yeah, probably not. Um, yeah, for, a, for an unusual skill, I'd probably say that. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, and whereabouts do you live? Um, I live in southern England. Nice, nice. Yeah, we were, we were saying before the stream that uh, you can't really hide the fact that obviously he's from the UK because the accent, right? Um, yes. It's a bit uh, of a giveaway. Yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, you could be doing an accent the entire time, but that that would be impressive. That would be more impressive than uh, than anything, really. That I would mean, be I your, up, I, your unusual skill, really. <laughs> I grew up in an in an area that has quite a naturally what it might be called a posh accent, um, which is not really me. But I can absolutely, if I want to go like sound like I'm from high society, I could try, but I just. No, well, it's like, very much not me as a person. The finger um, out while you're yeah. drinking tea, do you do this? Like, Pardon? Do you put your finger out when you drink tea sort of thing? Is That's kind of posh, isn't it? Oh, well, I mean, it's, uh, no. I mean, I, I normally drink tea in a mug, 
if I have tea. I, I right. don't really drink caffeine, to be honest. It, it's very difficult um, to do with a mug. I just tried it and I almost hit my teeth out, honestly. <laughs> um, uh, are you more of an outside or an inside person? I'm definitely inside. Yeah, like almost all my hobbies are indoor hobbies. Yeah. I, um, yeah, like I, most of the sport I play is indoor sport. I do a lot of stuff on computers and things. Um, I like being outside, but like it would never be my default choice of thing to do is right. something outside normally. We, we made indoors to be able to do things indoors. Out, outdoors already existed. We had to invent <laughs> indoors. So, uh, what yeah. a great invention. <laughs> Uh, how do you balance other things in your life with puzzling? Um, recently much better than in, uh, the last few years, I'd say <laughs> that's largely down to, I think, you know, lockdown, changing a whole load of things, right. Uh, for a lot of people, including me. And then, yeah, it's very I easy to just I... set puzzles all day during lockdown. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a bit more solved from my end, I'd say, than oh, set, yeah, but, but yeah, yeah. Sure. Like, it's, um, it's very easy when you like have not much else to do, you want something that's going to at least like make your brain work, uh, you sort of naturally end up doing things like that. Yeah, so true. yeah. Uh, a bit of a weird question, this one, if you could go back in time and see the moment when one word was used for the first time, what would, re what word would you choose? When one word was used for the first time. I'd love to know who came up with the word shenanigan. Yeah, that, that would that's be an great, interesting that's one. That's a good word. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite words is um, omni shambles, which is where yeah. everything is a shambles. It's like everything's <laughs> going wrong. But that, that word was created uh, in the mid 2000s for a, for a, a comedy show. And, uh, and then it, it got used like seven years later in uh, in the British House of Parliament, and now it's in the dictionary. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, the, yeah, Bells is right. That would be a good title name for a puzzle. <laughs> Omni shambles. Well, Omni shambles. <laughs> <laughs> we, we basically implied that everything in the puzzle is rubbish. So um, yeah, not, not what I would necessarily aim for. Um, maybe it maybe a better but, puzzle comment. <laughs> yeah, maybe other people would would, uh, would beg to differ. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the last thing that you ate that was like really, really cool, like really unique? What thing I ate that was really cool or unique? Gosh. Um... That's a difficult question. Unique. Hmm. We can Not really sure. I mean, I, I like I like all sorts of weird food. I'll mm -hmm. tell you what I, I did enjoy. I once went to a uh, I once went for work to Vilnius, Lithuania. Mm -hmm. And on the last day I was there, me and uh, three other people I'd got to know while I was there, went out for a meal in a sort of traditional Lithuanian eatery away away from sort of the uh, old center with the sort of more tourist trap places. Right. And I had some stuff there that was for me very unusual. I enjoyed mm -hmm. that a lot. I, I eat basically anything. I'm, I'm never going to say no to trying something new. Um, yeah. Why, why not try something new if there's something new on the menu? That, that's my, my attitude. Yeah. It's not very posh of you. So. I agree. <laughs> uh, what is something that you own a lot of? Um, decks of playing cards. Hmm. I, I, if I go on holiday somewhere or visit somewhere, I like to get a deck of playing cards with like local landmarks or something to do cool. with the area I visited. So I have, I think, somewhere between sixty and seventy decks, and nice. I think. I think some, I think that's someone I've spoken to in this community who's got more than me, but I think they're also a lot older than I am. So is it like, a, um, yeah. 
Like, you wouldn't just put any old deck into this set. It's, like, curated by, like, the places that you visited. Yeah, like, so, yeah. like for example, um, when I was younger, my, my mother went on a trip with a friend of hers to Madrid. Mm -hmm. And she came back with this double deck of um, bullfighter playing cards Ooh. from Madrid. And uh, I've used them ever since as my kind of, I don't care what happens to these cards. So <laughs> like they get brought out as like the regular ones to just play or any old thing because I don't really care if they get damaged because they're not ones that I went and bought from a place that I went to. Right. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Madrid. I, I need to <laughs> actually visit there myself at some point. No, I've only been to uh, Barcelona in Spain and uh, once to the very north coast around Sol Santander, Basque country area. Do you travel a yeah. lot? Not really since COVID. Um, mm. the, the, last, the last place I went abroad was Japan, and that was uh, pre-COVID. I haven't been out of the country, the UK, mm. since COVID. Um, partly because I haven't felt as much of a need to travel in a strange sort of way. I think it's partly because I didn't see my friends for so long. That, right. You know, for me now, a great trip is just going and spending some time with them because they're spread all over the country. So I don't really feel much need to jump on a plane to go somewhere just to get some sun or something. It's not really me. But like mm -hmm. spending time with a good friend is always good. Like last night, I went to visit a couple of very good friends. Um, and that was that was really great, and you know that to me is is as good a holiday as anything. Yeah, but facts. <laughs> uh, if you were to be interviewed on a different topic, what would you choose? <clears throat> that depends. Um, is is it like a pressure interview or a relaxed interview? Uh, kind of a relax. I mean, is this a relaxed interview or is this a pressure interview? Uh, I'm a, if it's a relaxed interview, or I'm hanging up. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, uh, um, hmm. I could definitely like. I mean, I mean, so I I play badminton. I love badminton. I could chat for a long time about badminton. I hmm. think it's great fun. So I'll probably be interviewed on on the ins and outs of badminton. And tactics and things. I like. I think it's a, it's a it's severely underrated sport, particularly <laughs> in the traditional West, right? Because it's dominated by East Asian countries, so oh. it doesn't get a lot of funding or coverage from Europe or the USA. It's like um, the only country in Europe that's got a really really strong badminton program is Denmark for some reason that I've never fully understood, but they just seem to be really good at the sport and. Um, yeah, the rest of Europe is sort of letting the side down a little bit. Although there are some, there's some upcoming players. There's a good French guy who who's who's just had a good couple of results recently. But hmm. yeah, English badminton not in a great place, if I'm completely honest. <laughs> Whiskey, Whiskey says says that tennis is better. Do you agree? <laughs> well, Whiskey is wrong because Whiskey <laughs> has only been exposed to tennis because Whiskey lives in the USA. Uh, so tennis has more money and more oh, sorry I, in... I misread Wistie's oh, opinion I misread oh. tennis but better what did he write? tennis but better oh tennis but better well then Wistie yeah. is completely right of okay. course so how could I possibly say Wistie is wrong Wistie is always right there we go <laughs> there we um, go. Whoops, no sorry. in tennis are very different sports yeah they're very very different sports um like tennis is so difficult to change like when you play at the top level it's very difficult to change the ball's direction mm. so, like it's very hard to go from a cross court rally to going down the line um whereas badminton because the shuttle is so light it's very easy to redirect it so it, it's a much more skillful and fast game badminton mm. um but each shot takes a lot less out of you because the weight of the tennis ball is is, is enormous when you having to hit it that hard consistently right. mm. so yeah very, very different sort of fitness styles are required to play each sport. Interesting. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you're, you're from Canada, so you probably played hockey and basketball, and, well, ice hockey, I should say, yeah. rather than, uh, yeah, because we have field hockey here, which would be what we call normal hockey. And then ice hockey is like, we now put the field hockey on ice rather than the other way around. Huh. Uh, I didn't know they thought about yeah. it the other way around. Yeah, well, exactly. Ice hockey is the normal version for you. So yeah. 
you, 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 why would you say the word ice every time you want to say hockey? It's just a waste of, waste of a syllable. So, yeah. Hmm. I'm learning lots of things. Uh, all right, let's learn lots of things about puzzles. Thank you to all the Patreons uh, for supporting this this segment, and let's move into the puzzle segment. So let's start with uh, start with the start. What was the first puzzle that you ever set? Well, this is a very good question, and it depends what you mean by puzzle. Um, so <laughs> I love when, when you approach it I, like this. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm far from the first person to come up with this thing, but the first quote-unquote puzzle mm -hmm. I ever came up with was a little maths problem I must have come up with when I was about nine or eight or nine, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it's a very simple problem. It's if you cut a like a circular cake into exactly three pieces, and each of those pieces is a fraction, which could be written as one over a, one over b, and one over c, where a, b, and c are all integers, mm -hmm. then and they're all different. Then what are a, b, and c? And I, I think I just I, I either worked this out myself or I heard it from somewhere and didn't really remember that I'd been told it before. But I think I did come up with it. My parents seemed to think that I did when back in the top, back then, whenever it was. But yeah, you can work out quite quickly. It has to be a half, a third, a sixth. Um, right. Okay. And that was yeah. If you think about it, one of them's got to be bigger than a third for the more to be different. So you have a half, and then you can repeat the trick with uh, a quarter remaining for each side. Right, but okay. yeah, makes um, sense. So like kind of puzzling and solving problems was something that I've been doing for a very long time. Hmm. Um, and then Sudoku sort of came along in, um, it came along in 2004 to the UK, I think, because it started being published in the Times newspaper. Um, and I, I've never really bought a newspaper because that's not my generation. And I mm -hmm. guess it's not yours either. No. Um, but um, I actually pulled a couple off our book, the bookshelf that we've got here. So, like, they used to sell like these books mm -hmm. of like Times Sudoku. So, I used between to Sue and Doku. These. Yeah, this is how they used to write it. You see, huh. back when it was first introduced, it was Sue and then Doku. Interesting. Um, now, now of course we just squash it into one word. But right. yeah, there's this guy called um, called Wayne Gould who was who was Described here as the man who started it all, but we all know that's not true. Um, <laughs> I think he is the man who built one of the first sort of generators for puzzles. I mean, you'd have to ask people who know more about the history than me. Yeah. But I started solving Sudoku type stuff in probably about 2005 um, hmm. and doing like classics, computer generated classics and things. I, I was introduced to them partly by. Uh, teachers at the time and i guess um my one of my grandparents as well and yeah i used to go on holiday and solve sudokus rather than read books on sun lounges because i don't enjoy reading very much and i'd rather solve a puzzle <laughs> so that was kind of me for years so i i had sort of years and years of solving sudoku um before like lockdown came even when i was a student at university like the student paper used to have like a sudoku in it and i would i would get the student paper just to do the sudokus it was the only point no, no one ever picked them up anyway no one was reading my student papers so and someone may as well take it and at least do the puzzle in the back um so yeah i used to do that um just to sort of tip, tip me over slightly um and i realized i've really gone a long way from the sort of question but i'm gonna get there <laughs> um but basically yeah like again lockdown when lockdown first came to sort of march 2020 so four years ago now it sort of changed so much for so many people including me i wasn't in a great place at the time um for various reasons but you know suddenly all the things that i enjoyed in my life were sort of taken away from me like couldn't mm -hmm. do them anymore like you know you can't, can't go salsa dancing in right. COVID. As uh, yeah, bit close contact and things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, and then the cracking the cryptic ended up getting coverage on um, like British media. I think because there was no other news, so <laughs> there was like 
is like these like articles started popping up because I I don't really use YouTube. Like I've never really used YouTube, but these articles started coming along the lines of like millions of people watch British man solve puzzle and things. Right. Like, and then there were these short clips of Simon solving the miracle Sudoku on like the BBC News, on the Guardian, which are the main two news sources that, mm -hmm. that I've historically used. And um and yeah, I ended up looking at it and realizing that I could sort of solve these puzzles. I I was reasonably adept at it. Right. Um uh, partly because I had the years of experience of doing the, these computer generated ones. And like I, this is another of those books. But like, believe me, if you think you've bifurcated three puzzles, you should try like all caged Killer Sudoku 2 from like back in the day. Like, because you just bash your way through them because that, that's all yeah. you can do to a certain extent. Particularly when you don't know advanced solving techniques, which I didn't. Um, but I did lots of these puzzles. I started doing the puzzles that Kraken Ecliptic featured just because I didn't know where else to get them. Mm -hmm. um, and then about a year later, um, I sort of solved. I sort of solved a lot of puzzles in that first summer when I was trapped inside, basically permanently, because I just sort of needed something to like make myself feel like I was doing something useful with my brain mm -hmm. when I was just locked up. And then, yeah, I sort of took a hiatus from solving in sort of the autumn, and then about sort of maybe uh april may 2021 i sort of came back to it for some reason i can't remember the exact circumstances but i ended up going back and um looking back at the channel again and then there was a puzzle on there that i quite enjoyed and i thought i could set something like that maybe i'd play around so i ended up making my first puzzle which is on lmd called the radiant diamond ring and that was sort of knocked up slightly off the back of a puzzle that I saw featured um, on the CTC channel. Um, and yeah, basically at the time I thought, kind of like I, I, I'd watched, um, I definitely watched Clover's setting video. I might mm -hmm. have watched, I can't remember when Zetas came out. I think Not Clover's definitely after. came out before that. Not long after. Yeah. I'm, I mean, no, no disrespect to Zeta, who, who is great, but I think Clovis was more helpful to me um, <laughs> in terms of like getting right. kind of how to think about setting something, how to think about putting it together. And yeah, I just sort of pieced things together. And I did, I did all the things that she said not to do. Um, <laughs> but sort of managed to fluke, fluke something that worked in the way I wanted. Um, it's it, it's a puzzle that was set in a way that no one should set a puzzle. Mm. Um, to be honest, all first set because puzzles I set should be set. It, <laughs> I set it backwards. Oh, it no. was it was set with a it was set with a deliberate finished grid in mind, and then I added some clues, and then was surprised to find that it ended up unique, sort of by accident. And I set it. I didn't know about setting tools at the time, so I set it in Pemper because I. Because I sort of knew from watching the CTC channel that mm -hmm. Emperor was a thing. Because obviously anything that was on F puzzles, they would solve with their own software. But occasionally they had Pemper puzzles. And I sort of knew that Pemper was a setting environment as well somehow. Right. So I ended up setting it in there. Um, yeah. And then I sort of was left with this puzzle, which, which like, I've made it about two months before the date it's published on ND, I think. A month and a half or two months. Um, but I was like, I don't really know what to do with this thing now. I've got it. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to join Discord because I sort of, partly because of the gas series, mm -hmm. I sort of knew that there was this Discord server that existed. And I didn't really use Discord at all at the time. I had set up an account during the first few months of lockdown in the year before because some of my friends had thought it might be a better thing to chat on than other apps mm -hmm. um but i had to like reset up my whole account for various reasons and stuff but it took me like a month to actually get an account <laughs> set up in like the name that i wanted and things but eventually i got it um and then put it in testing and then yeah people started like a few people started trying to solve it and stuff and yeah 
it was it was a weird sensation in a way of like people doing this thing that I'd made. I and um yeah, overall I was quite pleased with it. Like it didn't have many souls. I know it's rated now, but it only had about three or four souls for a very long time. Um yeah. But um yeah, I sort of ended up yeah, working out how the I've never written in HTML before. I've used I've used quite a few programming languages here or there, but I've never used HTML. So I copied the flavor text from um or the plain text HTML from uh Demono's Everything is Rogan. And then I worked out what was doing what and edited it until it was my puzzle and not his. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so... over time I've actually learned I've actually learned some HTML now. So, like, so I, funny. I do have my own setup now. But initially, I was very much just like someone else will know what to do. And as with all things coding, you just copy someone else's work as a starting point, and then you modify it. Yeah, because otherwise you spend ages writing the same stuff over and over again. Oh my word. That is. If yeah. tomorrow wants to make any copyright infringement claim, he's more than <laughs> welcome, and I will laugh. Um, <laughs> Give me a land. Uh, okay, so we we answered a lot of these questions during that. Uh, were, were you? Did, did we? Sorry. Yeah. Are you? Are you <laughs> that was no, a long, okay. long and rambly answer to one question. I will admit. But... No, it's a good conversation. Uh, are you, is, it a, is it a conversation if, if I ramble? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, is that a definition of a conversation? Um, are you still happy with this puzzle or or is this kind of just like... <laughs> I'm happy with it for what it is because yeah, okay. like with the intention with which I set it and if you solve the puzzle, you'll understand why I set it backwards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm happy with I'm happy with it, and I feel like it has an interesting flow. It has one there's one step in there that I I think nowadays if I was setting I would look at that and go uh, no that that's a bit that's a bit too kind of meh, mm. small amount of bifurcation needed may, maybe but but not not a huge amount and it's not terrible, um, but it's more than I would put in a puzzle setting now you know like I obviously I've changed a lot as a setter since then um i've learned to sort of the style for myself and things but back, back then it was very much a case of um you know i felt like i was joining when i was setting i was thinking, there's all these people who who've been setting for ages who set all these very clever puzzles with interesting geometry and things like that mm -hmm. and i didn't think i would be able to do that i thought that was something that was probably beyond my abilities, particularly when I started out. So I sort of aimed to um, to make things that I thought would maybe be fun, or at least based around a theme or an idea, rather than mm. just it was this very logical thing that you know everyone else is trying to make these very logical things. Let, let's kind of take that a bit and then make it sort of into something thematic and fun, hmm. and hopefully that will maybe get people to have a go at stuff I make. Um, and yeah, over time I've moved a bit more from the very, very thematic to sort of somewhere in the middle, but I still, right. I'm still not one of those setters who comes up with like some really clever, fancy geometric setup and then sort of like lets that do most of the work. I, I'd rather sort of meld it with something more entertaining hmm. if I can. I think I did have... Yeah, I, I have a almost comment here, but more of a question like, I think you're one of the only constructors that like really just takes like a theme and then makes it into something very unique, like unique rules and logically enjoyable. How do you go about like deciding how to theme your puzzles? Like, I mean, not just thinking of the theme, but like, how do you connect the theme to the logic, I guess? Um luck no luck, um, okay. uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a good question i mean i think again, when i started out i'd made that first puzzle and then after that like i didn't have any idea what else i wanted to do mm -hmm. or what else i might do um and to be honest like what what gave me a prompt to try and make another puzzle was the monthly prompt channel in the ctc server 
um, it was an Alice in Wonderland theme, and I made mm -hmm. the second puzzle I have on LMP in response to that prompt. And it, that is my worst puzzle by some distance. Um, like it is, it's just nonsense. Basically, I tried to make this like Mad Hatter tea party themed thing, but with half the rules break half the time and things like it is. It's just nonsense. You can logically solve it, but it's it's not a very coherent thing. Um, I just sort of knocked that up, sort of in response to the to the prompt. Um, and yeah, like I, I saw a lot of my puzzles. Like if you go on the on the CTC Discord server and search for things, messages from me in the monthly prompt channel, uh, at least before this year when I've sort of taken over helping to run it, um, uh, you'll find that quite a lot of my puzzles are in that channel. There's probably about 10 to 12 out of my 30, maybe maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, because so the monthly prompt often gave me an initial idea or some thought, and then I would take that and I would run with it and say, what can I, what twists can I put on this? Yeah. Because again, I think partly when I started, I think I was probably afraid to set a very vanilla puzzle with just standard rules, because I felt that people, you know, like people like Kodak or Nivario or Clover would be able to do it much, much better than me. And I would rather pull something else out, you know, like, I know you've had other interviewees who've said things like if you make your own rule set then you get to sort of be the master of it before anyone else and um, that at least was sort of slightly my philosophy of i may as well just try something really weird and then some people are going to like it some people are just going to go you're a mad person and not touch it but you know uh it, it's entertaining to try and come up with something new um I yeah. mean, looking, looking back on it do you think that those thoughts like that you you shouldn't make normal variants do you think you were justified in that or do you think you could have I think done just as well i i don't really know because looking looking back like i mean i i got extremely lucky with uh the graveyard of ideas hmm. um which was the fourth sudoku i made um I got extremely lucky with how well it was received. Um, it had the fortune of, you, you know, on LMD, I see people look at like the, the page of like the 25 newest puzzles quite a lot of them. They look for a puzzle there to pick. But when I published Graveyard of Ideas, it had the good fortune to stay not just in that top 25 most recent, but the five most recent puzzles for about two days. Hmm. And if, if a puzzle stays in that top five for that long, which was extremely lucky, just happened that no one posted puzzles after me for a while, then people see it's being solved a lot and they go, oh, I'll try that, oh, I'll try that, oh, I'll try that. And it just sort of built momentum um, hmm. in, in a way that was very unexpected because I set, I set that puzzle in under two hours in a mad rush um, because I had this idea. I sort of wanted to churn it out before I left to go somewhere. <laughs> um, and I banged it out, I put it in testing, and then I had to like drive an hour to go see go see a friend of mine. And then, yeah, by the time I arrived, um, one Discord user, I think their username was something like Mimimar Mimimarkin or something like that. They were active around that time. I think they had tested it or something. Maybe Crusader 175, although I'm not certain. Um, it's hard to remember now. But like there, a few people had tested it, but it hadn't had a huge response within the, the testing channel. So I didn't think it was anything special mm -hmm. um, or going to be as well received as it ended up being. But then, yeah, when I put it on LMD, it's just everyone seemed to love it, um, <laughs> which um, was a big surprise. But I think the thing is, is I got lucky with that. Mm -hmm. I think that when you set novel rule sets, particularly as a newer constructor, you're either going to get fortunate or you're going to get <laughs> no one looks at your puzzles. Because, yeah. if, because if your puzzles are too weird, like my Mad Hatter one, for example, then no one's going to look at them because they'll just go, oh, this looks too complicated and too much effort for this. Yeah, it's, um, it's really funny how people often say like, oh, the rule, the rule shouldn't be like a, a book. And then all of a sudden there pops up one puzzle where the rules are a book, but everyone loves it. Like, it's yeah. not consistent at all. Um, <laughs> There's there's no consistency to these things. There's a lot of luck involved, and anyone <laughs> who says there isn't is lying. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, that is that is the truth of the matter. Like whether puzzles get traction on on Logic Masters Germany or not is entirely down to when they get published. How many puzzles get published in like the two hours after they get published and things like yeah. this. Um, and I can, I can, I, I, I've got very strong anecdotal evidence for that. I won't say proof, but anecdotal evidence is very, very high. Um, yeah, but as, as far as setting vanilla puzzles at the start, I don't know. Like, I think, I think I moved towards that during that first like autumn of 2021. I started moving towards setting more plain rules puzzles um, because I gained a bit more confidence. And and I had a bit more feeling of belonging in in the in the CTC Discord at the time, so I started setting uh, what we might call normal puzzles. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I still tried to theme them. They were still often mm. set in response to monthly prompt, but um, yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe less mad. Um, yeah, I don't. I won't say I've stuck to being less mad since then. But, I, I don't uh, think a lot of people would say that either. <laughs> so, no, no. I think I think my reputation does precede me slightly on some yeah. of my weirder puzzles. <laughs> uh, so going back to the the graveyard of ideas. So you you say you got lucky with that, and then you got your your first CTC feature out of it. So. Uh, I guess we can talk about a little bit, like, how did it feel to, I don't know, get lucky with that and have that feature? Did you feel like you were justified in that feature or like what? I mean, it was, it was such a weird sensation of everything happening because like I published it, I want to say on a Sunday night, like Sunday, Sunday late afternoon or something. And then, yeah, it was, it was just racking up solves and it was, um, you know, it was my first puzzle to get a red rating, right? Um, as well, because like most of my other puzzles had like, ten solves, right? So I didn't even know the ratings because I didn't really use LMD to solve. I used to mm. solve a lot of puzzles. I wouldn't submit solution codes. So like, there's there's a whole bunch of puzzles that are on LMD that I've solved, but I've never submitted a solution code for, and I wouldn't be able to go back and find them because it's ancient history. You know, but uh, literally, I really know the there are so many people who do that. Red. So many people do that. I know. Like from the CTC solve counter, now I know how many people yeah. actually do that. It's crazy. Yeah, but, but it's but it's fine because like not everyone should feel they need to make a Logic Masters Germany account to solve I puzzles. Yeah, and I, 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 I'm kind of I'm kind of in favor of people who just solve and don't want to interact with the whole rating system and stuff. I mean, I I choose not to interact with the rating systems by rating everything very nice because I don't care. Um, <laughs> True. As far as I'm as far as I'm concerned, the rating system is is nonsense, and True. therefore I'm just going to upgrade everything, whether I think it's good or bad. And if you want to know how I really feel, you can talk to me. Um, you know, people will know that when I test puzzles on like Skunk Works, I'm pretty direct with my feedback. Like I I like to be clear about what I think about stuff, but still, I'm still not going to support the way the ratings are structured on LMD. But uh, yeah, no, as far as the CTC feature went, it, it like yeah, what happened was I published it, uh, the puzzle, and then I think it was the next day. Um, it wasn't the next day I got the feature, but it was the next day. Um, uh, Simon said in his introduction or some, something on the lines of, "We've had a puzzle recommended to us by Udikos," and I knew Udikos had solved Graveyard of Ideas and left a quite nice comment on it. Um, and I just thought, this is my puzzle. I know this is my puzzle in a sort of weird way. Hmm. Um, but because I'd already submitted a different puzzle to them earlier that month, and the conditions of the like, you know, they right. say you only submit one puzzle a month, I was a bit reluctant to send it to them. Um, so I, I did write a solve guide and I sent it to them a week later. So I think on the following Sunday, maybe, and it got a feature the day after I sent them the solution guide. Um, so I think they were waiting for me to send it in, to be mm. honest. Um, yeah, but it was it was extremely validating because it kind of made me feel, oh, I am making good stuff. Because, you know, the first few puzzles where you get like four or five solvers a time maximum, you just think maybe what I'm doing is too weird or no one really likes it or something. Right. But 
yeah, like it, it obviously, you know, I you know you've interviewed a lot of people, some who've had many more features than I have, and you'll hear them say things along the lines of, oh yeah, you know, CTC features, they don't mean that much, blah, blah, blah. But I think often they forget what it feels like that first time because, mm -hmm. you know, like I you know, I have a lot of love for like Zeta, Bremster, Ranks, Crusader, Wen Chang, anyone else who I'm forgetting, sorry. Um, Navario. Including you, I guess, occasionally you street puzzles. Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> uh, occasionally. Um, but... Mm -hmm. Like CTC is the biggest beast out there by a by a long shot. There's a huge audience. And like because under the Graveyard of Ideas video, they they didn't know how to recreate the dates in the cages. Mm -hmm. Um, because I worked that out and they didn't know how to do it. So they used my tiny URL link. Right. So I have the data for how many people clicked that link, and it was like twenty two thousand people yeah. did that puzzle. Which is and orders of like, magnitude higher crazy. than anything I've, on I've made, Germany. Well, exactly. I, 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 so I've made something that, like, maybe probably not all of those people have solved it, but you know, I've maybe made a puzzle that's been solved. If we say twenty-five percent of that mm -hmm. group has solved it, over five thousand people have solved this random thing that I made in under two hours. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was a it was a, it was a weird experience of thinking that like I had somehow like made some sort of inroads into like so many people's lives like in a small way but you know the yeah. fact that i had done something that so many people had interacted with and yeah it, as i say it was it was extremely validating in that mm -hmm. sense the sense that you feel like you've really made something that people really like and yeah that gave me a lot of confidence actually and i think it was partly because that went so well that i started talking to people a lot more on the ctc server i think i was quite quiet up to then um because i didn't really know anyone i didn't really feel part of the community um but then i started talking to um well i was already talking to a few people i, I was talking to prime weasel before that xenonetics um crusader 175 um but yeah not not many people um and yeah then i started talking to people like clover it's like oh clover you know yeah, like, exactly. um, I mean, it kind of makes yeah, you feel validated right. in like being able to interact with people, you know, like you're on their level or something like that. I don't know. It's not really like that at all. Like we're all just human no. beings, but. <laughs> but it can feel like that. And there's certainly yeah. like, I mean, it doesn't help when a lot of people come to, they come to the Discord server, the CTC one in particular, they come there having often watched the channel and they hear, you know, they endlessly hear, particularly Simon say, the great Zeta Math, <laughs> the great Clover, the great yeah. Jay Dyer. And you, you see these people talking, you're like, I can't talk to them. They're the great. <laughs> like, it's, it's, um, it's a weird experience. It, it, and I think it's a bit intimidating for, for new people when, when they do that. And I think it's really important that we, like, as a community, always try and welcome people in. Like, don't just like say like don't test Sudoku's and give no good feedback. You know, yeah. say oh this bit was good, this bit could be better. Hey, do you want to chat about this? Like, it, I think it's beholden to all of us who are sort of regulars in the community to sort of chat to new people and make them feel as welcome as possible. Yeah. People in the chat are asking about the origin of your name. <laughs> Um, hmm. some mysteries are best left unanswered. I don't know. I um, anyone who knows me in real life will will understand where my name comes from, and I'm happy to leave that there. Okay. So you'll have to you'll have to try and bully it out of me another time. Uh, well, maybe we'll we'll ask some other audience questions so that we can get some answers. Uh, other than the the jam. The jam of origin. Uh, what's your favorite type of cheese? I was, I was thinking of bringing along a loads of pots of jam and just holding them up <laughs> like one by one. But no, sadly, I did not want to buy large amounts of jam to uh, have this interview. So, uh, yeah. It wasn't a, requ a requirement. <laughs> uh, 
Prime Weasel had asked, what's your favorite type of cheese? Oh, right. Um, <laughs> yes. We were, we, were talking, we were talking briefly before this interview about how apparently everyone thinks I make cheese and chocolate. This is what we've learned <laughs> from my intro video. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, my favorite type of cheese is probably a cheese called Morbier. Um, I think it's Swiss. It might be French, but I think it's Swiss. It's a, it's quite a, it's quite a, it's not a hard cheese. It's a slightly rubbery texture, but it's like a thin layer of blue with like two halves with a thin layer of blue between them. And I was introduced to it by, um, a great couple of friends who I met skiing. Uh, with my university some years ago and and the there's a guy and a girl and the guy was really into his cheese and he knew this <laughs> he knew a bunch of good cheese he bought this one and i just loved it um but i, I can't get hold of it because it's too expensive uh, in the uk because it obviously has to be imported and there's only like right. three shops that i know that will sell it anywhere remotely near me so <laughs> yeah no no more ba for me but um if anyone wants it it's spelled m-o-r-b-i-e-r more ba um and it is delicious it's nice not That's a very, very strong good. cheese but just a nice a nice cheese yeah but <laughs> i do very, like cheese very detailed answer for that question i wasn't expecting um yeah well you know, ask, <laughs> ask me a question and i will tell you no lies uh, <laughs> anyway. uh another big question similar to the cheese, uh, Kodak asks, what's your prime motivation for setting puzzles? Yeah, I had to think about this mm -hmm. because I think, to be honest, I don't really have one, hmm. um, in a strange way. I, I think it partly comes to the fact that I consider myself much more of a solver than a setter. Hmm. Um, like I don't set puzzles on like a regular basis or make time to set puzzles regularly or anything like that. Like it's, it's not something I really do. Um, sometimes I just have an idea and then I seem to run with it. Often I, often I try and get some kind of external prompt. So like, you know, the monthly puzzle prompt channel used to be that to a large extent. Um, yeah, now I'm helping run it. Obviously I can't prompt my own <laughs> ideas through monthly prompts cause that would be, uh, that would be wrong so i can't really use that anymore but like yeah secret santa for example like um you know i've set six puzzles for secret santa and all of those with maybe one exception was sort of ideas that, the, that my sanity had sort of said oh i might like this and this and i'm like okay mm -hmm. what can i do with that you know mm -hmm. like um there aren't that many puzzles i could think of that i've set so, well, maybe there are a few, but like where I just had an idea without any kind of external reason to try and make it. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's a weird it's a weird one. To be so I guess your prime I, 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 motivation. Totally unusual. Yeah, I, like, I don't. I think I don't. I, say I don't really have a prime motivation. I guess it's like, like external like, you know, factors, like, right? Like some something else yeah. wills you to set exactly so like um you know graveyard of ideas was set in response to a halloween monthly prompt hmm. um uh yeah um i'm trying to think of other good examples um my one of my recent puzzles astro navigation was set because shy had done a load of guide arrows in the gap channel and i've been yeah. quite enjoying guide arrow i thought how can i make a guide arrow hybrid so I thought, okay, I'm quite enjoying this genre. Let's let's try and make a hybrid out of it. And then I came up with various rules to try and tie numbers into guide arrow. And um, yeah, I ended up with that. Yeah, I. If, we, if, I, if I think back to each puzzle, there's probably a story behind where it came from, in one way or another. Hmm. Um, but it wouldn't be the same for each one. I think it'd be different basically every time. Like my most recent puzzle, um, Diamond in the Rough, again, was a bit of an accident. There was someone, I can't remember their username, um, but we were test solving a puzzle they'd made in Skunk Works. And it was, um, it was a load of lines in the grid. It was meant to be some sort of meme that I, I don't really know memes. So it was something <laughs> to do with that. But um they made this initial pattern with like entropic lines going crisscrossing through the middle or something 
Oh god! And it was quite unrestricted. They'd had to. They'd had to add in a load of other unusual constraints and rules, and it was a bit weird how some sections of it worked. And I said, why don't you pick like a different kind of line that's more forcing through the middle? And so I opened up, because I was streaming this at the time, I opened up uh, Sudoku Maker, which is great, by the way. Everyone should start yeah. using Sudoku Maker if they're not already. Um, and I just drew it with region sum lines, this big plus in the middle, not the diamond, the big, a big mm. plus. And, uh, and then someone said to me, Someone said, "Oh wait, I've just drawn that and it has no solutions." I was like, "What? Why does it have no solutions?" And then I went away and I explored it. Mm. And then in, uh, I think in either that evening or the next day, I like in my head that the idea sort of formulated, and I sort of made it in. I made the base of it in about thirty minutes. And then I played around a little bit with some of the uh, the final clues just to get something that I really liked. But yeah, again, like it was just a random occurrence that led to that puzzle. It was the fact that I'd test solved this other puzzle that gave me this idea. Hmm. And I just happened to draw something that just happened to be broken. And I was wondering why it was broken. Right. And I basically found if you left if you left the middle square out of the big plus, i.e. made the diamond, then you've got these really weird and quite cool interactions, sort of by accident. Right. I, yeah, I, th I think Mixo, Mixo solved it because I basically I posted it from my phone, which is very unusual for me. I, I posted it in a, in a testing channel on Skunkworks in my phone, basically saying, I've just knocked this thing up. If anyone wants to take a look at it, I might try and tidy up later. Mm -hmm. um, I think Mixo's comment was on the lines of, I can't believe nobody's done this before. It seems so natural and obvious. And um, yeah, I surprised myself, to be honest. Well, that actually sort of leads to Ron Planer's question, which was basically along that line, like, can you think of a puzzle where you thought to yourself, why haven't I come up with this myself? I, I, I felt this was also an interesting question, because mm -hmm. I think to be honest, the answer is no, yeah. partly because I'm not that motivated to set puzzles <laughs> regularly. If someone else comes up to me like, oh, that's cool. Like, but like, you know, it's never like, Oh, why didn't I come up with that? Like, I don't really, I don't really ever think like that. Right. Um, I because it, it always feels like, oh, this person's come up with this thing. That's really interesting. Whereas, like, you know, when when I come to set, it's more like, okay, what do I want to do? And I always start from a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And I have a I have a document, like a text document, with like a long list of ideas of things I might want to um, might want to set at some point. Um, I think the only the only one off that that someone else did before me was a puzzle which was just going to be called What the Fork, just for the sake of it. It was going to be a fork shape, just for a joke. Um, but somebody, some, at least one other person has made a What the Fork puzzle before I got there. Um, but I don't think that's the, such an idea as a shape. The legendary fork race, yeah. <laughs> They got there before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, do you have any specific solve or any specific setters that you normally solve from? Um, again, I try. I try not to, and there's a few reasons for that. Firstly, um, I think that there's good stuff to be found everywhere. I think that tying your personally, my view is tying yourself to go, oh, I'd solve all, all of X's puzzles or all of Y's puzzles. Like, it means oh, that you sort of have a, an automatic... Pardon? I, said, I just said I'd love Y's puzzles. It was just a joke. <laughs> oh, well, you love Y's. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But you, you know what I mean, right? If, yeah, if you yeah, tie yeah. yourself to that, then sure. you're, you're restricting your choices to a certain extent because you feel obliged to do them. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to be quite careful of that because I have a I have quite a naturally addictive personality, um, which I'm quite careful to not allow. To, I, I try not to feed it. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I started saying, like, you know, I've done, I've done quite a lot of say mixo puzzles. If I said to myself, oh, I'm going to solve every mixo puzzle, then in my head I would feel obliged, uh, like I have to now keep completing mixo puzzles, and it would right. it would eat away at me. If, published a new one and i just can't let, i can't let myself think like that because mm -hmm. i don't think it's healthy for um yeah. so um 
you know, like I, I do stop quite a lot of mix those puzzles because he, he sets some great puzzles. Um, but like, you know, like I tried to do it in Yuri Maze hybrid series. I, I did all of them up to the crossing slithering one and then I stopped. Um, <laughs> Because I knew where my limit was of how much theory I was willing to do within one puzzle. And unfortunately, that one was it, as Mixo sort of knows. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, I'll try, I'm willing to have a go at anything. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the nice thing. I'll try anything from anyone. Um, and normally, if I start something, I won't give up on it. Like, I'm very mm -hmm. bad, again, because I have this sort of completionist nature. I'm very bad at saying, no, I should stop doing this now and do something else. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's something I have to be quite conscious of. Like there was one puzzle from CTC Sudoku testing. This is back in like 2021 that I decided to try and test, and it was a bifurcation nightmare, like beyond <laughs> anything you'd ever believe. Um, and it was it's the worst thing I've ever solved, like by a long <laughs> shot. It took me like two days. And I just couldn't let it go because in my head I'd started it, so I had to keep going with it. And it was just awful. Um, yeah, like don't, don't be that guy, like who, who yeah. like me, who feels like this, you've got to finish something when you start because it is not good when you get bogged down in something that is just bad for you. Mm -hmm. Facts. Uh, take this advice. Yeah, definitely take that advice. Amen. <laughs> Uh, why don't we talk about, and then there were none, because <laughs> this is a puzzle which is a little bit different from other puzzles. Do you want to talk about why it's a little bit different? Well, this was another monthly prompt puzzle. Right. And this came about because uh, Zegres set... Um, Set a riddle theme monthly prompt in, I want to say March or April. I think it was April 2022, I think. That's what it says on the LMD, so. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, that would be right then. Yeah, no, um, uh, he set this riddles prompt, and, like, you know, he'd had um, about two, maybe three features on CTC with these sort of, like, maths riddle puzzles. And... Not, not that I, I mean, I love Zegres, but as far as I was concerned, a maths riddle's not really a riddle. It's a, it's a problem that you can solve. Mm. You just need to find the right words in, in the question. And I thought, I'd love to set a puzzle that was actually riddles. Right. Um, and the first idea I had was to try and do something from The Hobbit. Mm. So to try and make something to do with like Bilbo and Gollum's game of riddles in the dark. Um, and I pulled out the, the Hobbit. I've got the Hobbit on, on the bookshelf next to me. Uh, and I looked through it, but I just couldn't find anything I could tie into like numbers in a way that would be in any way satisfying. <laughs> and I remember sitting and thinking, because at the time I basically I basically was in the habit of setting a puzzle like every month for monthly prompt. I did something at that time. So I was like, okay, I've got to think of something because I always do something. Mm -hmm. So what can I do? And then for whatever reason, and I, I cannot tell you what it was, I thought of Agatha Christie's and then there were none. Um, I think it was in, I want to say 2017, maybe 2016, um, the BBC, which uh, most people watching will know is like the British Broadcasting Corporation. They, they make great content, publicly funded broadcaster. Um, but they did a, an, they did an adaptation of this. And I've never, because I don't really read many books, I've never read Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. So I watched this adaptation of it, then there were none. It was three one-hour episodes, fantastic cast, brilliantly shot, really well done. And I loved, I loved it. And for some reason, this, this thought came to my head of, ah, hang on, I could do something like that and then tie each death to a different kind of constraint and I could <laughs> maybe make it work. And... When I first put it together, I sort of thought, oh, it's brilliant. I've done this, this thing and it's, it's so clever. I put it in testing and no one could do it. Like, <laughs> there's just no hope. Because obviously, like, I had come up with all the answers. I understood yeah. how it all worked, but it was not well constrained or explained in the rules. And 
over time, I got, I, 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 I edited it. I got some good feedback from, well, I think you, I think you did it. Yeah, I, I did correctly. do it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you tested a slightly earlier version. Um, but Taku tested it and suggested it made a couple of very good suggestions of changes. I think maybe Angelo tested it. I can't really remember. It's again a long time ago now. Yeah. But yeah, like the, the, there was, I got some good feedback. I made some changes. Um, I added a key, which I, at the time we could only put on Pemper because at the time we didn't have the ability to export from Pemper to Sudoku pad. Mm. Um, if I made it again now, I would make the Sudoku pad link have a key. Um, because watching Simon struggle through that puzzle without a key was very upsetting. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, because what ended up happening was like, I published it and again, like that puzzle had about two souls, maybe three for the best part of a year. Um, <laughs> because Zegres, Zegres did it. I, I think, I don't know if you did it, maybe you submitted a soul. I can't really remember. But um, I think I think, I, I, think I took a while to submit a soul on LMD for some reason. I think I just kept forgetting. So. I, it doesn't, doesn't it. matter. But I think, I think two of my testers, mm -hmm. whoever they were, and Degres, who did it because it was for his prompt, did the puzzle, um, and that was it. And no one else dared touch it. They had looked at it and just went, I can't do this madness. Um, and yeah, it was it was March, so sort of around this time last year, but a few weeks before, um, I had tested a puzzle for Chile in Skunk Works that had been quite brutal, and mm -hmm. I said I was going to get my revenge on him. Um, and so uh, about a week afterwards, I, he ha I said, do you have some time? He said, yes, because he was streaming in Skyworks. And I said, okay, here's a puzzle, go do it. And I sent him and then there were none. And it turned into this hilarious group solve with all these people trying to chip in and help. Wisty in particular got extremely angry with me <laughs> about various parts of the puzzle. Um, but at the same time, like it, it was so funny watching watching it happen, and it was this kind of hilarious event. And then um, off the back of that, I think Riff Clown said, "I might send this to Cracky the Cryptic," uh, and I said, "You can't send them this puzzle. It's not a logic puzzle. Like it just doesn't fit their billing." And and then we had a discussion, and we said, "Okay, we can submit it if we say it's for like April Fool's Day only." <laughs> Right. Like maybe, maybe go over that. I didn't submit it myself. I, I let the others make that decision. But I think about maybe three of them sent to the TTC and said, look, this puzzle will be hilarious on April Fool's Day. And then, yeah, Simon, I think I, think I broke Simon quite badly. <laughs> but he did it. He did it. And he and the thing is, is that, like, yes, he overlooked some stuff. And yes, he made a couple of mistakes. But <laughs> fundamentally, he did understand the puzzle. He did work it out, and it was—it's—it's it's simultaneously infuriating and satisfying to watch, like because there are moments where he's on the right track, and then he has a wrong idea, and he, he goes down his wrong idea, and um, yeah. But there are there are certain things. If he if he'd had a key in the sidebar, I think he'd mm -hmm. have understood it much quicker and made fewer mistakes. I think the fact that the fact that he tried to do it without a key. He colored each death the same color. That was a mistake <laughs> because if you, what, what I always encourage and think what I told Chili to do when Chili solved it is if you think you've identified where a victim is, color the key in that color and the spot in the grid in the same color and do a different color for each one. Right. Because then you can, like, you can at least look and go, oh, this person's going here, this person's going here, right. and so on. And because Simon didn't have that, he got so confused about which line was which and things that he kept getting in a small muddle. It was a bit of a shame, really, because, mm. yeah, he, he did, as I say, he, he got it much better than I thought he might, but two and a half hours at the time, <laughs> that, that was one of the long, I think it's still one of the longest solves they've ever yeah, done. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, but yeah, I felt, I felt a bit guilty at the time, but it was also very funny to watch, I'm not going to lie. But I think what annoyed me more was that the comments underneath of people like, like, there were some people claiming they understood how the puzzle worked. It was like, no, like, he's actually, Simon's got it. If you watch the video, he, you actually realize the fact that Simon gets the pop up saying the solution is correct. He, he did work it out. Um, 
he misses one he misses one key detail in one of the rules which is mm. why it's uh yeah but there, there's so many comments under that video uh, it's, it's certainly yeah. very easy for people to comment like oh like the wording should be changed here like it's really easy to overlook that and even get like get like 20 yeah. people to solve it and none of them even think about that part but then you get like what is this had like oh, seventy two thousand oh. people yeah like someone's gonna catch it right like someone is gonna think something yeah. is unclear I'll, I'll tell you something else as well wisty wisty set for me in secret satan this year which i decided mm -hmm. to take part in and wisty decided to take elements of lots of my own puzzles and sort of make them into one slightly bonkers yeah. thing which was quite fun um but one of the things wisty decided to take was um the fact that in and then there were none the rules obviously rhyme and wisty wrote a version of the rules that were like in poetic style <laughs> and <laughs> i was discussing it afterwards yeah they agreed very strongly that uh writing rules that rhyme and are coherent is rather difficult um, yeah i can imagine <laughs> uh, especially yeah, especially if we're trying to be cryptic, which is what I was trying to do, obviously, for then there were none. Like, there was no yeah. point in making an and then there were none puzzle and having the rules be explicit. If it's not a mystery, it's not Agatha Christie. So, yeah. like, I had to make them in the way that I did. Um, but it was, so, it was so outside of what I usually do, because, yeah, like, I'm, I, I have a couple of puzzles with the mystery tag, including and then there were none. But, like, it's for for logic masters germany it's uh it's a very unusual puzzle it's only really on lmd because i don't have anywhere else to put it so um yeah I, I i have never looked closely at the mystery tag but i love how it's like oh mystery like it's like a <laughs> like sign a way. Like, yeah. yeah 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 it's funny um all right that that was a good discussion that that's such an interesting puzzle um do you have any piece of advice for people who want to set or early setters that would that helped you um i would advise i would first of all i would advise solving lot of puzzles I think that, um, you know, I think Mixo sort of alluded to this in, in mm -hmm. his interview as well. Like, if you've solved a lot of puzzles, then setting comes more naturally because you you have ideas about where, as a solver, you would look next or what kind of thing you would want to find. Right. So you kind of instinctively you, you put things down because they feel like the next logical step. And um, people will know this. I I get annoyed with people who um like i say to them like they say oh i've set this puzzle and i say when did you last set a puzzle and they say oh i set two today and i'd say how many puzzles have you solved and like oh i've solved three in my entire life now i'm exaggerating obviously but <laughs> like i think you should be solving probably minimum at least uh 30 30 puzzles for every one that you set i think as a rule um, and I know that's, <laughs> that sounds like a lot. If you if you include things like gaps and gap in that, that's not that bad. But the point is, is that like if you get input from other people's ideas, you're going to have more thoughts about what you could do with something. I think right. just setting constantly without solving is a real fool's errand. Personally, mm -hmm. I think the quality of your output, you'll you'll have hits and misses much more because you're endlessly trying to do stuff all the time without. It's all taking time to absorb ideas, but always trying to throw them out. Yeah. And I think that you've got to balance that. Um, so, like, you know, my LMD ratio is now, I've sold over a thousand on LMD now, but as we've discussed, it's, it's actually probably quite a bit more than that because of all the puzzles I didn't register solved for. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've published 30. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a big difference in ratio there. And I think that's healthy. Um, and that's not accounting for gas and gap, which I've solved every puzzle gas and gap I've ever made. So, right. yeah. Yeah. So I would advise that. I would advise solving all puzzles. I would also advise not being afraid to just do whatever you want. Like, you don't, don't worry too much about the feedback early on if it's negative. 
you've got to take it as a learning experience of like what works, what people like, what people don't like. And then eventually you'll find your groove if you stick mm. with it. Yeah. Um, you know, don't just sort of, you know, do what you want to do. Don't don't be afraid to try something just because you think other people won't do it. There's always some mad people like me and Mixo out there who will basically try anything if we really, really want to. Um, there's, a, there's a high ratio of mad people in this community, so uh, you're bound to find yes, someone. Yes, that is probably <laughs> true. Yeah. Uh, speaking of solving every gas and all that, Agent asked a question about solving every daily feature of CTC and any puzzles that stand out as a strong influence on you as a setter or any favorite puzzles that you'd like to recommend? Yeah, so I, I thought about a bit about this question as well, because obviously, like, as I sort of mentioned in my very early rambly answer to what's the first puzzle you ever set, I um, um, I started at least attempting every puzzle that CTC featured in that first, like, window of lockdown, for, so sort of from, like, late March, maybe through about May, June. I would at least have a go. I I wasn't always very good because, like, there's often with the variants, it was new ways of thinking that I hadn't encountered mm. yet. So I would often try to do it, the puzzle, get stuck, look and see what Simon had done or how Simon had tried to approach something, go, okay, I see how he's tried to think about this. I hadn't thought of that because I'm not familiar with this genre or whatever. And then right. I'd go away and slowly but steadily, I, I sort of learned from it. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I honestly can't remember when I started doing the puzzles of CTC feature every day. Um, but I think I've been doing it probably, probably for almost as long as I've been setting. So probably mm. two and a half years. I've right. done Simon and Mark's featured puzzle, unless I've already done it. Um, of course, which there was a period where I'd often actually done the puzzles that they featured because I was testing loads of puzzles, um, probably because of lockdown and not being able to do anything else. But, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like for me, for me, I think it's a good way to pick up puzzles of different setters again, because CTC, particularly Mark, Mark will do puzzles by people who are quite new to the community, who maybe haven't made necessarily the best quality puzzle, but like it's their first puzzle or something. And like, it's encouraging for them to see like, oh, CTC have picked this up, this is great. And I think yeah. that's really good. You know, CTC doesn't have to always do the very best puzzles in the world. And if they did, uh, Simon's videos would be much, much longer. Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, um, yeah, but as far as really good ones, the things that really stand out to me are actually the early ones. So like, I, I won't say the Miracle Sudoku because actually the Miracle Sudoku, once you understand it is relatively trivial, um, without wanting to be disrespectful to Mitchell Lee, cause it is, it is a great puzzle and it's interesting, but once you see the pattern, it's sort of done. Um, yeah. Uh, but the two that I re were really standing out were ones I looked, I looked back to find these in the CTC catalog. There was, um, Nurikabe Sudoku 2. I didn't see the first one until I'd already seen the second one. That was by, uh, Matthias Martinka, I think it was. And I've never encountered Nurikabe before. Um, it might've been called Rivers and Islands rather than Nurikabe actually, but, but it was basically a puzzle with arrows and the arrows pointed to the number of cells that were, if, if the cell was land, it was the number of water cells it pointed to or something like that. And there were some really interesting ideas in that, that like I would just never be able to think of at that time. Mm. Um, and I loved that puzzle. Um, and then I can't remember which one it was, but there were a couple of puzzles which were like first hidden skyscraper. So it was like a skyscraper clue, but rather than the number of buildings, it was the height of the first building that was hidden. Um, right. And again, there were some really interesting ideas in there, things that like I'd have never even imagined being able to think of myself. And like both of those puzzles, for example, I think I had to like pause videos and like look back and go, oh, that's that's interesting. And like I had to use Simon as prompt at that time. But now if I went and did it, I'd be able to do it because I've developed a lot as a solver. Um but yeah, like there, there are some there are some interesting puzzles back then. Um I would say like, you know, the there's sort of there's there's themes that come and go and and popularity that rises and falls in constraints and ideas at the moment you know it's the counting circles and zipper lines 
um a year and a half ago it, it was all fog 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 um <laughs> and uh region some lines as well you know like these these constraints sort of come in they have their vogue period and then they sort of they don't disappear but they become less common like you know there was the big set period where every other oh, puzzle was set as well you know like you know, and but the thing is, and the people complain about that now, but at the time, if we're being honest, most of us who sold a lot of those puzzles were so used to finding sets that we would find the most bizarre things, and it wouldn't seem that difficult. Whereas now we look at set puzzles and we get confused because we, we've kind of moved away from that as a community. Thanks, So, God. you know, like... <laughs> um, but it's interesting how these popularity sort of comes and goes for things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, the, the Rivers and Islands 2 by Matthias Martin, I would say, was probably the one that really stood out. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted, I've made a note on this little thing, piece of paper with like thoughts about these questions. I wanted to give a shout out to Clover's sense of place, um, mm -hmm. of which Everest featured on CTC. Um, Everest took me ages, because I didn't, at the time, again, it was one of those things that like, I hadn't quite figured out the geometry. It took me a long time, a lot of thinking about it to see what it was that I was looking for. And it was very, it was very instructive once I found it. But I loved that whole pack of puzzles. I, I when someone's new to kill a Sudoku, I say to them, go and solve Clover's sense of place. Because it may take them ages, because some of the puzzles are quite hard, but you'll learn so much about mm -hmm. killer. Yeah. And killer's a great constraint to practice like variant on because it's simple. But it's not like it, there's so much you can do with it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like I mean, yeah, that 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 whole puzzle pack is is fantastic. Um, and I think Clover will tell you I'm either the sixth solver or the first, depending on how you categorize it. Because, um, yeah, her meta puzzle at the end turned out to be slightly broken in its original form, and I discovered that. Um, which led to my first chat with Clover, where she was extremely direct with me um, in a very Clover way. Um, I, I, love, I love Clover. When she, wants, when she wants to tell you to stop talking, she is extremely clear. Um, uh, but yeah, like, I, I found this tiny little error in her final metal puzzle, meta puzzle. Um, and yeah, like, uh, I thought at the time she, she wanted to punch me through the screen. Which was quite bad, <laughs> but eventually we, I think eventually we ironed out that difference, and she she came up with a slightly different formulation of it, and it was fine. Um, but yeah, no, I love that pack, and I'd recommend anyone to go and do it. It's somewhere in the Discord archive, or in like, uh, or in like Sudoku suggestions or something. But yeah, it's it's a great pack of puzzles. Yeah, Everest is still definitely up there as like one of the best puzzles I've ever solved. So. Mm. Uh, definitely agree with that recommendation. Um, talk us through the emotions you feel when you start setting a puzzle. Um, hmm. I think the first emotion is, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> uh, like, what, what am I aiming for? Like, there's a lot what of kind fork? of uncertainty at the start. <laughs> or like, yeah, what the fork? Yeah, will, will, this, will this idea actually work how will i need to adapt it to make it work like there's a lot of things that go by with that like often it's just a case of like i've got this idea for a rule set let's just throw something in the grid and see what happens right um and then oh okay that's interesting now can i build the rest of the puzzle sort of around this initial starting point hmm. yeah i guess it depends like i mean it, it depends a lot on the kind of puzzles like if you're setting a puzzle with standard constraints then it's quite easy to not get frustrated because the solver can just check for you whether you've already made a mess of it. <laughs> yeah. So you know you don't rely you don't rely on the solver to solve the puzzle, but you rely on the solver to tell you, oh, by the way, you've already broken it. Stop yeah. wasting time here. Go back and do something else. Which is very um, useful. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I guess it varies a lot from puzzle to puzzle. Often, often it's very frustrating trying to find like those last few clues that just work in the right way. 
by uh, I think that's the most frustrating part is when you get towards the very end and you're just looking mm. for the perfect final clue that often that often takes me longer than anything else actually but I feel like I've got the bulk of the puzzle done but I'm trying to find that that last little bit that just mm. resolves everything without blowing up something from before or shortcutting it right <clears throat> yeah that is the bane of the setter's existence sometimes for sure Uh, do you find more enjoyment in solving or setting? Probably solving, because like I, I think uh, I think that they are similar experiences in a way because it's, they're both processes of discovery. But I'm the kind of person who likes to problem solve. So mm -hmm. if you throw a problem at me and say solve it, that to me is that fits more with my personality than. Here is a blank slate. Make something out of it. Um, right. So I think for me, I get more of a buzz out of solving problems than setting puzzles. But I do enjoy both. Um, I think when it comes to setting, I just have to have, as I said before, I have to have some sort of direction or reason to to do something. Yeah, it's it's almost as though the direction is the problem, maybe, and you're trying to solve the yeah. problem by setting something around it. Yeah, I, I think partly that, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. What makes you want to solve something versus not want to solve it? I was about to just say anti-night. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, I would say the thing that makes me not want to solve a puzzle is... Um, if I've seen too many of a set of puzzles being solved recently, like mm -hmm. it's partly going back to that. I like variety. It's like, I think the first thing I look for in a, in a puzzle is like, have I done a lot of puzzles by, or seen a lot of puzzles by this person recently? If yes, then I'll discard it and do something else. Like, you know, um, I think that's just a, a healthy approach more than anything. Right. But I'll, I, I'm the kind of person who will give a go at anything as long as it's not too theoretical. Uh, well, I, I, I get to a point with puzzles where this, like the setting experience should be about like theory and ideas, but I feel that the solving experience should be about you're able to find work this thing out from the thing you've been presented. And I dislike the idea that I have to spend half an hour to an hour working out exactly how this thing behaves to make any progress. And I realized that as I'm saying this, people are going to accuse me of being hypocritical. But um, I feel like, at least in the case of Bletchley Park, which is which is the puzzle of mine that most matches that issue, the the understanding of the rules is one thing, but you have to understand the rules. I don't expect you to work out any theory attached to those rules. I expect you to be able to read the rules and sort of process and internalize them. But that's true right. of any puzzle. So well, I think yeah. that Bletchley Park is quite an extreme example, but at the same time, it's not. It's, it's not asking you to work out a load of theory in order to solve it. I mean, uh, Isaiah asks, uh, why did you decide to do something as evil as Fletchley Park? And we'll, br we'll bring it up so people have some context here. I think that Isaiah, first of all, isn't allowed to ask that question because Isaiah hasn't solved the puzzle. So okay. um, I think if you speak to anyone who has actually solved Fletchley Park, with the exception of Belzita, who let's be honest, hasn't really solved Bletchley Park, and she knows that. <laughs> uh, um, almost everyone who's ever done it has said it was almost a journey, like an experience in and of itself. And, and I, I'm not saying I was setting out to create something like that, because I wasn't. But I knew that it would be an extremely unusual puzzle, doing something very, very different. Mm -hmm. And that it would challenge people in, in a way that they weren't used to. But I think for the people who've actually tackled it and persevered with it, the, the feedback's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and I, I, I'm extremely proud of it. It took me a week to set. Um, like I, it, did, it took me like seven evenings of like slowly working because I had to go through like every option for every clue, which took ages. Um, before I chose which ones to use. 
Um, but um, it had been in my head for about three months before I actually started setting it because um, around this time last year, we, you know, we talked about how puzzles sort of have a vogues and come and go slightly. Um, what was really in, quote, in last year, I think, around this time was Japanese some cipher puzzles, um, uh, like Japanese some hybrids. Mm -hmm. And I got very annoyed because all of these puzzles have the cipher tag on LMD, which they shouldn't have. They should have the encoded tag because encoded means like a digit is represented by a letter consistently. Right. Whereas cipher, a cipher means one of two things, really. Either the cipher is the little key in the corner of your puzzle where like A is one, B is two. That's a cipher, not the letters in the puzzle. Or it's like a message. Like a cipher mm. has to like encrypt something that like reads as a, an actual uh, document or continuous line of text. So basically, I had this idea in my head of I'll make a, an actually ciphered puzzle to show these people who've put all these ciphered tags on their puzzles that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I had the idea of what it would be and how it would work sort of in my head. And then, yeah, once I started trying to set it, which I say it was in my head for a long time, I just couldn't set anything else because I couldn't get this idea out of my head. It was haunting me because I knew how hard <laughs> it would be to set it. But at the same time, I sort of knew I had to do it. Hmm. Um, when I eventually I started, yeah. and I, yeah, when I actually started putting clues in the grid and making the thing, I found, oh, actually, hang on, this is way more restrictive than I thought it would be when I set it up like this. Hmm. And I can actually make these clues interact like this. And I came up with all these little ideas, and I built them all in. And yeah, it's um, it's absolutely like you can you can attack that puzzle without too much knowledge how to solve a lot of those sorts of puzzles and you can work it out but it will take you ages i don't think anyone's done it in less than three hours mm. um and to be honest that's an incredible time but <laughs> yeah i think i think Clash code who i have a lot of love for but i think i may have broken his brain because i think it took him the best part of two days <laughs> uh, yeah jesus yeah it's it, again, again, it depends how you're. Uh, uh, most of my puzzles, if you approach them the right way, they're not as difficult as they look. Right. But if you don't approach them the right way, they can be monstrous. Um, <laughs> which, I, which I kind of like because it kind of means you can still bash your way through if you really want to right. on a lot of these puzzles. But, but at the same time, there is a clean solve path to be found. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of your job as a solver, I feel, to go and try and find that path. Yeah. It's funny because a lot yeah, of... Yeah, Isaiah is not allowed to pontificate on whether the puzzle is evil or not because <laughs> he's not done it. A lot of people who say stuff like that, uh, I find, are the ones who like the uh, think about this for 30 minutes and then start solving. But it's funny that you don't. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm not disputing that Bletchley yeah. Park is very hard to get your head around. Like, uh, the rules are as clearly written as I could make them. Like, I spent I spent a lot of time rephrasing them, and I, I ran them by uh, Mixo, because Mixo Test solved it for me. Um, I sort of unleashed it on it, because I'd say <laughs> I've been working on it for a week. I kept saying I kept saying to people, this kind of works, I'm working on this puzzle. And they were like, what is this puzzle that you're working on? I was like, oh, you'll see it when you see it. And then when, <laughs> yeah, I think it was like a Saturday evening, I just finished it. I ended up having to add one extra question mark clue because I realized it was, I think I'd made a teeny tiny assumption at one point right. in my setting process. But I basically just unleashed it on Mixer and was like, here's this puzzle, have fun. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah. It was, I think, I think the comments in Skunkworks were like, what the hell have you done? <laughs> An extended period until Mixo actually started solving it and founding, hang on, I can actually do this. And yeah, hmm. yeah, I think he, he took about three, three, three and a half hours, I think. I can't really remember now. It was a long time ago. But yeah. Do you feel like that you're good at writing your own rules? Yes, I do. And... I'm happy to make adjustments when, if people come to me with what I feel is legitimate criticism of my wording, um, I will look at it and I will debate it. 
but um i feel if people if people say oh you should do this or you should do that and i don't agree then we'll have that discussion but ultimately it's my puzzle and i'll make that choice um i got into quite a big argument with henry pie james um which uh many of us are familiar with because he's, <laughs> he's a real rule sticker which is helpful yeah it's yeah. good to have someone like that around who challenges you um, but we got into an argument over the wording of the rules for astronavigation because he objected to some of the phrasing of the guide arrow rules. I was just using the guide arrow rules that, mm. that the gap, gap people use. So as far as I was concerned, they were clear and they were concise. And then I was modifying them with the extra rules and things, and it was fine. But uh, Henry was not keen on that today. So um, we got into a <laughs> bit of an argument. That's all right. And in the end of the day, it's my puzzle, so I'm responsible for, for the wording. Do you have any tips yeah. for people on how to write clear rules? <laughs> uh, copy them from someone you trust. <laughs> Honestly, that's the simple thing to do. Like, find, find a setter who is, if you're doing a standard constraint, find a setter who you trust, whose wording you like, and just use that. Like, it would be really helpful, to be honest, if we had like standard rules for each mm. variant. Like you know, like recently, cracking the cryptic have changed their like region sum line ruling yeah. rules to like box borders divide or something like this. Um, uh, yeah, box borders divide lines into segments of equal sum or something. And I don't actually, like, those rules are concise, but I'm not sure they're as clear as the longer form rules. And I, I prefer the longer form rules for region sum lines. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm not a fan of um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like, it, it's fine. You know, like, if they want to, like, they reworded the rules for diamond in the rough uh, when they did that the other day, when Simon did that the other day to those. And I don't, I don't mind too much. Because ultimately, it does mean the same thing. Yeah. But um, you know, for my own my own rules, where I publish it on my LMD page, I'm going to use the version rules that I like, and I'll stick with that. But yeah, in the past, I've definitely just copied other people's rules for like killer or arrow or something, mm -hmm. and then just stuck with that. Because if someone else has used it and you like their wording, then why would you do something else? Yeah. But if you're doing something novel then it's kind of your job to think very clearly about how something is defined and make sure it's clear. Um, and often that is difficult. Um, but I've made multiple puzzles where that was very hard to do in a concise way. And being concise is important because people, we've sort of alluded to in, a, in previous discussion, if you have like a big book of text for your rule set, then people will look at that puzzle and just discard it because they mm -hmm. don't want to read all of this. So finding ways to be brief while also being exact is a skill. Um, and if English isn't your first language, then I think you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help with that. Like yeah. people will help you. So sure. yeah, you know, yeah, run it, run it by other people. For That'd sure. Be my advice. Uh, MicroStudy asked an interesting question. What is your favorite pineapple related thing from Nago Pineapple Park? Oh, yes. Give me a minute. Hang on. <laughs> Let me Google Nago Pineapple Park while he's gone. It's, it's a theme park in Japan. Yes, I meant, I, I forgot that Michael study had asked this, but I meant to bring these bottles with me. Um, so first of all, we should explain for the uneducated that uh, Nago Pineapple Park is a, um, is a random theme park in uh, uh, Okinawa, Japan, uh, just outside the city of Nago. And uh, it was built sort of to help support local farmers um, <laughs> to save off cheaper imports of fruit, like pineapples. So it's kind of like a support our local pineapple growers. Um, and I was there in 2014 for reasons. Um, but I bought a couple of things with me. So this, I kept this bottle because I don't want to ever throw it away. This is uh, Okinawa pineapple sparkling wine, hmm. which is, uh, has been drunk. 
uh, now. But yeah, like uh, it, like it, it's brilliant. Like you go through the kind of I don't know if it's still this way. I hope it is. But you go through like this gift shop area after you go through this whole pineapple tour. Like in this place it is, it's fantastic and there's just like loads of product products all made with pineapple like pineapple vinegar pineapple shortbread you, you just think of anything there's pineapple version of it and it, it's just fantastic <laughs> but yeah uh bottles of alcohol are basically the only thing you can safely carry uh back from the other side of asia to right. to the uk so um <laughs> Yeah, I have that bottle. And I haven't opened this one, actually. I've had this, again, for like, yeah, nearly 10 years, but this is passion fruit wine from the same place. Um, I don't, I have no idea how this tastes, by the way. I just bought it because I thought it would be fun. But, um, yeah. <laughs> now, um, yes, Pineapple Park is fantastic. And if you, if anyone ever goes to Okinawa, they should go at least once, or you've not, you've not done Okinawa properly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Awesome. I have a lot of love for, for Okinawa, and I would recommend anyone uh, anyone who goes to Japan to try and hop over there. It's quite separate from the rest of the mainland, but it's uh, it's beautiful, and the people there are fantastic. Yeah, Apart from the Americans, no, I joke. The Americans are fine as well. It's a big base in Okinawa, but um, yeah, the, the the people there were, were just brilliant. I, I loved my time there. I was there for two months, and hmm. it was just beautiful. Cool. Uh, quick, quick visit back to puzzles. Uh, Wisteria <laughs> asked, as a setter, how do you consider telegraphing? I I'm guessing when you're setting. Yeah, uh, interesting one. Um, I would say that telegraphing is it's easily done if your puzzle has minimal cluing. If your puzzle doesn't have that many clues, then by definition, it's well telegraphed because you've got nowhere else to look. Right. <laughs> so, to be honest, I've never, I, I very rarely actively set out to to make it kind of obvious where to look in a puzzle, but I often I try and set quite minimally mm -hmm. most of the time. Or like sometimes, like I get, I guess in Bletchley Park, there is quite an obvious place to look first once you you know spend time reading the rules. Um, but I don't think telegraphing is as important as some people think it is. I think if you're trying to make easier puzzles, it absolutely is. But if you're trying to make a harder puzzle, I think part of the challenge is working out where the restrictions are and figuring that out. I, I think that's part of solving. And like often when I'm solving a puzzle, I go on the wrong tangent all the time. I try and do the wrong bit of the puzzle first and then have to go, oh, I've wasted loads of time here. But you haven't. Because you spend time looking at an area of the puzzle, make, get, making no progress, but you learn things. Yeah. And that sort of goes in your residual memory. And then eventually when you get back to that point, having found the right bit, and then you get back to that area that you spent ages looking at, you just whiz through it. Because yeah. you spent ages looking at this thing, and you, you sort of you built up an understanding of it without being able to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, so to be honest, I, I sort of personally don't buy into telegraphing as, as a thing that's essential. But that's partly because I set harder puzzles, and I feel right. that solvers who tackle my puzzles should be prepared to spend some time looking at the puzzle and going, where is the restriction here, like, and trying to find it. I think that's mm -hmm. important. And I, think it's more, and I also think it's very important in novel rule sets, because with a novel rule set, spending time trying to see where the restriction is really helps reinforce how the rule set is working to the solver. Mm -hmm. So they, they, um, they come to understand, oh, no, this isn't restricted because of this when they're looking at a certain part of the grid, and then they go somewhere else. Right. Like a classic example would be um, uh, my Secret Satan puzzle that I set this year called Working 9 to 5. Um, the, there is uh, one part of that puzzle, the grid, that looks like it should be the most restricted bit. And then when you look at it, you find that it works with the rules there. <laughs> You have to go and find somewhere else. Now that that bit that looks restricted ends up being step two, but step one is uh, slightly slightly better hidden. Um, yeah, I think that I'd say, I think that's part of solving mm -hmm. is uh, is yeah finding finding that for sure. Okay, let's go through some rapid fire questions before we run out of time here. We still have twenty minutes, but. Uh, 
just to break it up. Okay, one or mm -hmm. answer the other fast as you can. Uh, high okay. lowity or odd evenity? Uh, odd even parity. Local or global deductions? Local. Coloring or good living? Coloring. Simple or complex? Complex. Favorite digit to dance to? One, two, three, five, six, seven. <laughs> That's a salsa rhythm. Okay. Uh, geometry or arithmetic? Arithmetic. Uh, Penpa, F puzzles, or Sudoku Maker? Depends what I'm making, but for Sudoku, Sudoku Maker. Okay. Sudoku or pencil puzzles? Sudoku. Chaos or order? It puzzles, chaos. <laughs> Big or little? As in what grid size or like, I, I'm not sure. I guess I want to say big, but I'm not a fan of like massive grid puzzles. I, I prefer things that are like normal size. No, normal, medium. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like in the middle, like nine by nine Sudoku uh, is, is good. Okay. Digital or analog? Digital. Cages or lines? I think cages, because I think I think killer is the best constraint overall. So mm -hmm. I think I have to say cages. Although I do I, I do like lines and I use lines a lot, but yeah, cages. Arrows or dots? Arrows. Indexers or chess constraints. Indexers. And I say that as someone who doesn't really like to set with either. Yeah. <laughs> indexers. I've used indexes once. I've never used chess constraints in setting. Mm. To disambiguate a puzzle, a given or an extra rule? Uh, go back and pick previous better clues. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I would honestly, if I get to that point, I'll just look for a slightly better previous clue. Um, I, I gave a digit once, but <laughs> so I guess I have to say extra rule. Because I've used one given digit in all of my puzzles, so we'll come, we'll come yeah. back to that. <laughs> Outside or inside clues? <laughs> um, hmm. I quite like clean, empty grid puzzles, so I'll say outside. But I like them. cheese or bread. Um, hmm. bread. Oh, I like both again. Like I think I think you need you need a bread product to have with the cheese. Prime Weasel's gonna yeah. gonna lose it. Uh, good or evil? Is he gonna <laughs> lose it because I've said, I've said bread over his cheese? <laughs> good or evil? Oh, evil, but not actually evil. Okay, it's more evil than good. Yeah, I think. We dropped a few frames on my end, but uh, we, well, I think we got the answer. Are we uh, lacking somewhere, are we? Yeah. Oh, I, I, can, I, uh, I can't really see much because I can't see the whole thing. So, I think it's yeah. good now. It it went down and now it's gone back up. So, uh, lawful or, it is. No or chaotic. Cares. Yeah, no one really cares. Lawful or chaotic? The last one. Yeah. Uh, I'm still not really sure what these terms mean, but let's say chaotic because <laughs> it sounds more fun. Okay. Uh, let's go back to you've only given one one given ever. Yeah. I, it's the, the six in Mad Hatter, the Mad Hatter's hat has a six, it has a ten, the six on it. I drew the ten with German whispers and then put a six in the grid. Uh, and that's the only time I've ever put a given digit in a puzzle. Um, I know, I, I, I'm quite happy to give solvers relatively easy wins early on to get digits in the grid, to get them going. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's just my style. I, I don't like given digits. I feel like if I was doing given digits, I'd want to be setting a classic, and setting classics isn't really my thing. 
So yeah, hmm. yeah, that's six right there. That one. It's the only given I've ever put in a puzzle. And it's kind of wild. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but to, to be honest, it's quite easy to make puzzles that where like you get some digits quite early, right? And then everything starts to be forced quite fast. And there's no real difference in my mind between that and putting given digits in. I'd rather give the empty grid and just make it in my mind clean. Hmm. But you know, that's just me. I wouldn't encourage. I wouldn't encourage setters to think like that because right. it's um, there's often a good reason to put a given digit in. You know, but yeah, for me, like oh, that's that's not what I like to set with, right. personally. Is it just because of the aesthetic, or is there some uh, moral reason? <laughs> moral reason? Yes, it's illegal, and I will be sent to jail if I dare put <laughs> given digits in a puzzle. No, um, I don't know. Like, I guess it's just a sense of I feel like I can always find interesting clues to start a puzzle without having to put numbers in the grid. I think it's also partly comes to the fact that I, you know, I chose arithmetic over geometry. Right. I, I feel like there's always something I can do where I can force some digits into the grid via maths mm -hmm. somehow that will that will start to unlock things. And I, I'd rather do that than give digits and then have them be used. Yeah, I, I guess that's just my approach, but you know, it right. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, how do you overcome creative blocks when designing puzzles? Um, I guess it helps that I only set when I have an idea already. Right. I don't really get creative block because I'm not setting so regularly that I feel the need to have an idea. So because I have no, I because I have no overwhelming compulsion to set regularly, I I don't suffer creative droughts because I'm not pushing myself to be creative constantly. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Are there any times where you just feel like you haven't had any ideas for a very long time? Um, yes. Um, I took a hiatus after setting, um, uh, I set the Victoria Sandwich as a lie, which is probably my hardest puzzle. This, I would say it's my hardest puzzle. I think it's harder than Bletchley Park. Um, and um, yeah, I think after that, I just needed a break um, that summer. So I didn't set anything. I didn't, I sort of switched off from the community and didn't really engage with anyone for about two and a half months. Mm. Um, but I think I came back from that break a better setter. Mm. Um, because I came back and then the puzzles I made since, since that break, I've actually been really proud of almost all of them. Like, um, the second graveyard puzzle, which went into, um, CTC's book two, I was really proud of that. I was really proud of back and forth, the Exum reverse Exum puzzle, um, which came about partly from, uh, the fact that I'd done reverse Exums, I'd, I'd done I think it's Colot who did the original one. I did it ages ago before. And then Codec was setting a uh, reverse Exxon's puzzle. And I saw Codec setting that in a CTC voice chat. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if I had ambiguity of like which way the Exxon's went, whether they were forward or reverse? Hmm. And then I came up with back and forth. And I was, I'm honestly, I, I love that puzzle. I think it's one of the best ones I've come up with. It's so simple, clean, got interesting interactions. Um, and it's like, you know, it's a short rule set, which is always the sign of a good inventive puzzle, right? Where the rules aren't that long, but it feels quite natural. Um, but yeah, no, the puzzles I've set since then, I think I've come up with some really good stuff, which I'm, I'm quite proud of. But I definitely took a hiatus after the Victoria Sandwich, which, yeah, is a, is a bit of a brute. <laughs> Right. Um, I think if you search hardest puzzle on LMD, it's currently ranked like 12 or 13 or something. Hmm. Um, but and it, then it's just among the list of puzzles that have all been rated five star by everyone who solved them. So like that's right. uh, there's, there's more that how those are ordered is largely irrelevant. But yeah, it, I think there aren't many Sudoku puzzles like standard nine by nine Sudokus that are harder than Victoria Sandwich. Right. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, it's a it's a very very difficult puzzle. <laughs> I remember some people talking about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those ones where if you find what to do, then it's really interesting and mm. it, it's quite fun. But if you don't find what to do, you're banging your head against a brick wall. You're going to get nowhere. Um, yeah. I guess yeah. It's, it's also a good yeah sorry I, no i was okay. going to say it's a good example of um part of my setting style actually okay. is i like often i i don't i'm not keen on having really really hard break-ins like the first step being really difficult i quite like puzzles myself when i make them where step like three or four is mm -hmm. a bit of a spike and I think for and for puzzles with novel rule sets, so I've kind of alluded to this already, where if someone's being presented with something brand new, you want to give them some easy wins early on. This is part of the no given digits thing as well. You give them some easy wins to sort of get them to sort of go, oh, okay, I see how this is starting to work. And then you sort of, you, you go along with it and you sort of see, okay, this is restricted here, I get this, I get this. And then I often like to put in a difficulty spike to mm -hmm. sort of say, okay, have you really understood what's happening? <laughs> This is the test now. <laughs> and um, if you pass the test, you can solve the puzzle. And if you don't pass the test, then you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and there's quite a few of my puzzles that have that. And unless you're codec and can solve mysterious boxes backwards, then you're going to get stuck doing step <laughs> three. Um, I still don't quite know how codec did that puzzle backwards, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, Codec has a reputation, I think, for doing puzzles backwards, which um, uh, is an interesting one. For sure, yeah. But I did put as his tagline on that in this intro video, uh, destroyer of soft fats. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely a reputation. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was going to ask before, in relation to that, you were talking about how do you balance creating puzzles that are challenging, but not frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I think that I'm to a certain extent not too concerned about that. I think the important right. thing is to get the difficulty rating right. Um, like it's important to present puzzles to people where you say you need to know what you're getting in for. Mm. Like, you know, like I, I think if you're going to, you know, it's, it's a bit like, um, I think the most frustrating puzzles on LMD are probably the unrated Vichdor puzzles, because they, they're all uploaded as three-star difficulty. <laughs> but as Mixo will tell you from doing his quest, and I helped with quite a few of those puzzles, a lot of those puzzles are very much more than three stars. And I think that's the frustration, right. is when you do something, you think it's going to be eatable. Like, that to me really annoys me. Mm. Um, I, I think for for other people doing my puzzles, again, I think it's really. It, I always say to people, I'm not too concerned about the percentage beauty rating on my puzzles. Like that can go hang, but I care about them going red because I think when they go red, that's sort of like a community assigned difficulty that other people can use as a, a reasonable signpost. Right. And I know that I know that difficulties generally get underrated on LMD because there's a lot of very good solvers there who think some tricky things are very easy, which mm -hmm. does, to be fair, include me. Um, but um, I think that having a red rating is sort of like, it allows a software to look at a puzzle and go, okay, other people found this this hard. Therefore, I should be prepared to have to think so hard in order to be able to do this. Right. And I think that's, I think that's important. Um, but yeah. I think you know, like read the rules of a puzzle. If it doesn't, if it doesn't appeal to what you enjoy, then don't make, don't, don't do it. Do something else. <laughs> you know, That's like true. don't get, you don't get frustrated by avoiding starting the things you're not going to enjoy in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, what setters do you feel your style is most similar to? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. I, I'm not. I, I'm not as. Um, I'm not as theoretical as someone like Feluta or, or Mixo. Um, I'm not as sort of elegant logic geometry 
there's people like I guess like Niveria or Toolcat or Codec uh, or others. You know, I'm, I, I could list setters forever, so I should avoid doing that. But yeah. you know, like I feel, I feel like I sort of belong in a group of solvers who all started setting broadly in in the same period, which is not directly after the Miracle Sudoku, but about a year later. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like, I would consider some of my contemporaries to be people like. Zen and Essex, Prime Weasel, um, Crusader One Seven Five, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I guess I get Prime Weasel and I definitely like solving each other's puzzles, um, uh, and we we do have a, a similar taste for occasionally throwing in something very hard or random. But I think my style is quite unique. Right. And I think it's also because it's quite eclectic. Like, if you look down my puzzle list, my, my puzzles vary a lot. Like, I try avoiding, I try to do, avoid doing the same thing twice a lot of the time. Right. Um, with the exception of like the graveyard puzzles, which I now am basically doing one a year of those. I've generally not gone back and done the same thing again. I try and do something different every time. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with your puzzle names? Um, I like my puzzle names to be funny. At least okay. that's what I'm aiming for. Normally they've got a pun in them <laughs> or they're a reference to something. You know, like the great the graveyard of ideas, I think is a classic example of like that that's a phrase. That, that's where ideas go to die, right? That's the mm -hmm. whole that's what the graveyard of ideas is, is the place where bad ideas go to die. So I thought it'd be funny to name a name a puzzle that because I had an idea to do a graveyard puzzle. <laughs> I called it the graveyard of ideas. Um, kind of like an uh, all shambles kind of title. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's a bit of it's, it's a bit of a, a joke that yeah. name. Um, Wanda's hex is referencing the hex that Wanda creates in Wanda Vision. Hmm. Um, uh, de-escalation is 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 funny because apart from the fact that I drew an escalator in the grid, it was also <laughs> referencing the fact that my previous puzzle was too mad and too bonkers. So I was de-escalating like oh. the nonsense. Right. Um, uh, absolutely amazed thing is another good example of like you know absolutely amazed thing yeah. is an obvious joke. Um, um, the Victoria sandwich of the lie is referencing portal. You know, the cake is a lie, the cake yeah. is a lie if, if you play that game. So Victoria Sandwich is a type of cake, it's a sandwich Sudoku. Oh yes. Sorry, I, I think it's a lag on where I see the screen is and you're going through all my puzzles. But yeah, arrow entanglement, I just saw prop up there is, is an absolute mess of a puzzle. Um, yeah, I try to do too much all at once. And as a physicist, you might appreciate it, but at the same time, it's still a mess. Um, yeah. I try and put puns or like little references in my titles as much as I can because I think to me that that's what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I, I like I, I like to try and make people laugh in life in general. It's just, it's just kind of who I am. So, you know, the the title is the opportunity to be a bit creative. Right. So that's normally what I, what I try and do. That, that's a good way of going about it. Uh... Last question. I'll ask the the classic. Is there a question that you wanted to be asked but wasn't asked? And what's your answer to that question? Hmm. Let me have a look at the list of the questions we had in advance and see if there's another one that weren't. Asked. Yeah, there, there were a couple that we didn't get to. Um Yeah, I think um I think I'll, I'll maybe I'll do Wisty's other question because I've got it done here. Le a least favorite constraint that I saw a good execution of. Um, so I don't like disjoint very much, mm -hmm. and it's not because I can't scan it, but because scanning it is really annoying. Like, yeah. I can do it; I just find it tedious. But there were two puzzles, both in sort of around September last year, that used disjoint that I really loved. Um, and both of them got CTC features. The first was Crusader's Wheels on the Bus, which I really liked. Um, and the other was um, uh, 
the other was Celery's Escalation. So rather than my de-escalation, <laughs> that's part of the reason I liked it is because it had a title similar to one of my own. But, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like no one could solve it. Seemingly, there was this puzzle that no one could work out how to do. And then I did it in Skunk Works, and I just I I remember I know Bell's Bell Sita was there. I can't remember who else was there, but she, she could say, I just said, I'm just going to try something really random and see if it works. And I just drew the correct thing in the grid and it all just fell apart and it was incredible. And for a disjoint puzzle, I was all blown away by it. And it's one of the few puzzles that I recommended myself to CTC because it stood out to me so much. And it got the feature off the back of my recommendation, which is the first time that's happened, by the way. Hmm. Um, I recommended quite a few of Grockles as puzzles back in the day, and they never did any of them. So, sorry, Grockles. Apparently, I was a bad luck charm. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I really liked that puzzle. There's always, there's always something interesting you can do with a constraint, even if most people don't like it, except anti <laughs> Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much, FGM. This was great. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined. Any closing words? <laughs> um, take care of yourselves and each other. Right. And uh, I don't have the next person scheduled, which is why I didn't tell FGM who the next person to be interviewed is. Oh, uh, is your cat around? Belsita wants to know. Uh, oh, yeah, he's he's been very good. He's slept the whole way through. Wow. He's got a little den just down here, but we can we can bring him on camera briefly if, if people want to see him. My cat is also um, sleeping very cutely. <laughs> as I say, he's very he's very old now. He's 17 and a half, and he's a big white oh. fluffy thing. He makes a lot of noise. Perfect way to end the stream. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. He's a, he's, he's a lovely, lovely cat, really. You're Beautiful very good. Cat. You're very good murderer, aren't you? <laughs> yes. He used to kill. He used to catch big pigeons. Um. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Anyway, this is this is the cat. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank the cat you. in my picture, very sadly. Uh, the cat in my profile picture, very sadly, uh, died just before I started setting, which is part of the reason I use that picture. Oh. Well, that's. But, yeah. That's. Kind of cute, but kind of sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, like these these things happen. He he was uh, nearly sixteen when he died, so he'd reached a good age. Oh, this fine. one's just living forever. Yeah, I guess so. All the pigeons, good protein. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, exactly. Take care, everyone. Have a good week. Oh, I meant to say it's going to be two weeks until at, le at least two weeks until the next interview, which is why I'm hesitant to like plan something uh but i'll maybe i'll have fjam announce it in a chat or something all right see you guys later okay. Bye, everyone.